this session is about PowerShell on Raspberry Pi. But to make the context a little bit, bit more interesting, I'll show you in the, the making of my Azure Connected Greenhouse. You might have seen this on Ignite. I did a short demo on Ignite, but without any tech details. This one will be with all the nitty gritty details of the PowerShell. My name is Jakob Gottlieb Svensson. Um, I've been speaking at PowerShell conference for the last five years, and I love to, to attend. I'm a lead developer and a Microsoft MVP, and I work in CT Global in Denmark. I want to say thank you to our sponsors, Microsoft, System Frontier, Script Runner, and PowerShell One, which without them, this wouldn't be possible. So thank you for letting me speak, be able to speak here for years, year after year. So my agenda is what do you need? The architecture, how it works. Then we're going to look at configuration. Can we do that automatically? Then we're going to look at some more about PowerShell on Raspberry Pi. And then a little bit about scheduling and monitoring the greenhouse. So normally I would show you the, the, the actual hardware. And trust me, this can be difficult to get through an airport. But this is my prototype. This is taken outside in my garden uh, yesterday. This is how it looks currently. Inside we have different devices, but let me show you a little video I took yesterday just to introduce the different devices I have. Yeah, so of course I'm going to connect some some uh, some pipes, some, some tubes with some water and also one insert one in, in the actual plant. So if I switch to my actual live cam, which is right here, you'll see that I have my little tube here. It comes from the pump and this is where the water comes out and the pump uh, water has been pumped up from a from an 80 liter container I have. So what do you need? You need a greenhouse or at least some plants to water. Doesn't have to be a greenhouse. But the Raspberry Pi needs internet. So you need to have a network of Wi-Fi in the greenhouse. In my case, I have an extender in my shed, which then extends my, my network into the greenhouse and that makes a super stable connection there. Luckily, connecting to Wi-Fi network in Raspberry Pi is super simple and built in. So you need a Raspberry Pi, three or four or five or six or how many it comes. But as long as it, it can run uh, a PowerShell, it uh, all right. The basic sensor, this little white one you might have seen on the, on the video before and, and picture. It This basic sensor, it takes temperature and humidity and such things, and it costs around five US dollars. The relay module, also five US dollars. And the pumps is about five US dollars each. So this is still under one hundred dollars, which was my initial title when showing on on an ignite. So if you go to my GitHub, this link you see right here, you can find links to where you buy the hardware. You can find guides to how to to set up. There's an install script that sets your Raspberry Pi up correctly, uh, and there is everything you need to make this run. So this is where you want to go after the session and 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 take my code and and improve it and and make me a pull request if you have some great enhancements. All right. So first of all, what we want to do is one thing we want to do is to send metrics from the greenhouse so that I can check if the weather is good enough for me to plant my plants or if it suddenly drops to low temperature so that I have to pick and move some of them inside. This is what we have to do when we live in cold areas. Uh, some of the uh, herbs and stuff, they do not uh, like basil. It doesn't really like cold temperatures. So it's super important to keep a watch that we don't go under five degrees Celsius, for instance. The same thing about going too high, of course. Plants get burned if it gets 
way too hot, then they, they also die. The humidity, since the temperature already catches humidity, well, it's a nice thing to see that if it's when it gets dry and when it gets really humid, um, which is fairly interesting to, to compare to the temperature changes, which you'll see when I do the demo in a second. What I have added support for and actually had in an old version that was based on Arduino was soil moisture. So, so connecting, putting soil moisture sensors into the soil so that I can test and see when the plant, when the soil is dry and when we need to turn on the water. We could add light either in the form of, of actual lamps or it could be simple shade, automatic shades that we could turn on whenever it gets too hot or too much light. So when we want to do this, we want to uh, have a greenhouse in the corner here and then we want to send metrics to our to to yeah to the cloud to azure besides metrics we well the metrics we want to send into log analytics uh, i have chosen log analytics because it's a super flexible system where i can super cheap save up to two years of of data i can super uh, um, i have super simple options to make alerts, for instance, but I also have super advanced options to make queries that would, you know, find trend lines or forecast whatever happens the next days, use machine learning to figure out when we had a day that was out, uh, that was abnormal or, yeah, there's so many things you can do in log analytics. So my initial idea was if I get the data into log analytics, I'm good, that's all I need. But we also need to be able to turn on the pumps so in that case, I chose to have a pull method where it, where it pulls its config every 30 seconds. So it connects and, and pulls its config. In my case, I chose SharePoint for the config. Why did I do that? Well, first of all, it's super easy to set up. It doesn't require any code. So it was quick for me to have a nice GUI for demoing. Besides that, I can actually make an, a power app. So if I switch here to my cell phone, you'll see that if I open it, that I can open a power app here and then actually open and, 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 and turn on off the valves in my greenhouse. And this is without code. This takes, you know, 10 minutes to make something like that. There is a video on, on GitHub, a link where you can see how I do that. So I can go into a house here, turn on the water if I want to do that in a second where you can see some more stuff but but actually sharepoint log analytics it doesn't matter because the whole point is we we don't we don't connect directly to sharepoint or log analytics from the greenhouse we connect to an azure function so the azure function provides a simple interface for the greenhouse to send and 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 request uh, data and then behind the scenes, behind the Azure function, we can make the Azure function in, in Python, in, in JavaScript, in, in PowerShell, of course, in C Sharp. If we have nice libraries for log analytics in PowerShell, we can do that. If our, uh, if our team is better at Python, we can do that. If we want to use something else in SharePoint, we can do that. It doesn't matter because the Azure function, as long as it it uh, makes this entry point, the endpoint for the greenhouse to connect to. Anything could happen behind that, those scenes. So we send into log analytics, we get from SharePoint. And then of course, since it's in log analytics, we can show it either in the Azure portal um, or in Azure workbooks, of course, or in Power BI or many, many third party tools that can, that can show data from, from log analytics. All right, so you've heard about the intelligent edge, right? Which is great when you have a remote location and you don't have a proper internet connection and you want some intelligence out there. So of course, if our greenhouse was on the top of Mount Everest, wouldn't be great that it was reliant on the internet. But since this is made for places with great internet, there's no reason that the device actually is pretty is, is uh, intelligent. So I'm introducing what I would call the, this is the unintelligent edge <laughs> because this little device is supposed to be as simple as possible. You'll see that the code on the device is very simple. There's no logic except get data, send data. 
And then everything happens in the cloud. It makes it much easier and much more flexible for me to change. So let's let's imagine I had a thousand of these houses and actually this solution could support a thousand houses without any issues. If I had a thousand houses and I need to make an update, well, if I made to need to make a configuration change that's specific for each of them, I would need to make a super uh, advanced um, management tool. Of course, if I need to make an update on the actual base code, well, you see, I, I got a trick for that. But but when we configure it, it's a simple configuration. And then data goes in and then we use the data from there. So first thing is I have a little the webcam live from the greenhouse. You can see it here. Besides that, I have my SSH connection that shows the running script on the actual device. This script run in, runs in what's called screen. So this means I can detach it and then I can log out and I can log back in later and then I can restore the connection by using screen DR and then I'm back into watching the script. You'll see later how I configure this. You see here it runs every uh, 30 seconds and it's, it gets its configuration. And whenever there is a successful measurement from, from the temperature and humidity, it also sends this uh, humidity temperature and then the state of the relays so that we can see in the, in the stats if they were turned on or not. You see it comes right there. And it gets its configuration. You can see valve one is off. But if I show you my cell phone here, as I said, and I change my, I change the valve to on, like that, we save it. Next time this runs, you should see turning valve on, uh, turning valve one on should be uh, shown here. Then it takes a few seconds for the webcam because it's a few seconds behind. So you see now it's on, so it has turned on the water now. And we should see water coming up. There we go. It works fine. And then important part here, remember to turn off the water. I had some issues with earlier prototypes and my wife was not so keen on me breaking multiple years of harvest of tomatoes. But anyway, you know how it goes when you do prototyping. It's trial and error. Yeah. This is how it works. Um, in a high level view. So when we talk about configuring the actual script, before I go and dig into the actual script that, that you'll see and the different things here. Oh. Okay. So if we look at the actual script, You'll see that this is a fairly simple script. I have a, a GitHub repo, as I said. A GitHub repo where I have the script and I have Let's take a look at the actual script and the repo. So the repo here is my PS Greenhouse repo. It contains the, the actual code for the functions here. You'll see that actually in this case, it's pretty old. Um, actually, the code itself is much older. And it did one of them, the get configuration, has a SharePoint connection. So it's actually using uh, functions with PowerShell. But this is an early version, actually. It's a PowerShell version one. So it, it uses the Windows PowerShell, so the old uh, preview. But of course, it can be easily translated into something else. Then we have the inject, OMS inject. And this is actually C sharp code, but again, it doesn't matter. This is simply to show that you can run anything. It's simply a, a, the cloud itself is intelligent, while the device is 
unintelligent or stupid uh, and um, and that's why we can actually do anything we want besides that we have the script here the actual scripts that runs on the on the device script here is fairly simple it loads some raspberry pi io dlls and it uses the powershell iot module this does not support all the, the functions i have here <clears throat> so that's why i have been added extra stuff to it <clears throat> and you can see that my version on github for the iot module is different than the actual um than the actual uh, official version i know that there is a new newer version um a newer version and and but but i want to add these changes to that new version but i haven't done so yet but it's fairly simple you see the get configuration function is simply calling a uh, web request and, and asking but it asks for the configuration of its own host name here so it gets its host name um yeah it knows its host name and then it uses that name to get the right configuration and that's why when you looked at my here you see i had multiple houses so this is home dev and if we look at the actual here you see that the computer name is home dev so in my setup here all i have to do is to set up a new machine gave it a name and then and then add it to this list to be able to control it so that's why what, what i mean by we could have a thousand devices on that list if we wanted to the other one is handle configuration where it gets after it gets the configuration it looks into it and it either turns on the pins for turning on that relay or that relay off you'll see on the in the readme on on github that that different pins uh, which different pins we are using but you can see it's actually set in a variable which is up here which pin is which relay so it depends on which version maybe of your raspberry pi you might have a another extension for the raspberry pi so you might want to use some other pins yeah so that's why it's done like that the other thing is there's a function that starts the dht and dht that's the sensor the dht sensor and this is actually where i had to do it uh, manually because the powershell module back then at least did not support it but i'll look into that soon to uh, to see if we can if it already supports it now or if i can help add support for this sensor so all it does is to create the sensor and just the way the sensor works is it you register an event so the sensor starts and it tries in an interval uh, to to find a, a, a successful measurement every time it has a successful measurement it's going to trigger an event so below here you see there is an event defined before i uh, talk about the content of that event i want to show you that down here we registered it, this event so when the device says i have data available this action event action will be called and it sends in the settings from our actual uh, configuration because of course there is a configuration for the actual uh, device i'll get back to that in a second if we look at this you'll see that it go whenever it has a measurement it goes and checks is the measurement valid something built in that it checks sometimes it apparently gets some invalid measurements and then we can go and we can actually read our configuration to find our api key to find our endpoint uh, URI, so so that we know where our function is and then we set up our authentication then we can read the different the different values and we can then construct a ps object which the different with the different values host name again humidity temperature celsius fahrenheit and the states of the relays and then we write it to verbose of course and then we just invoke web request and then we post it to our function right so i mentioned this con app settings here <clears throat> because of course i do not want my my repo to contain api keys that's the one no go that exists <laughs> that's the worst <clears throat> uh, that exists in all of um uh, of github uh, uh, bad practices you can do so i've made a configuration file called uh, uh, 
G House Config JSON. And in here we have, you see, the send URI, send URI uh, API key, get URI, and get API key. This file is a file you put on your Raspberry Pi next to the script. It, it's uh, on the actual uh, Raspberry Pi and not inside Docker, which you'll see, you know, in a sec that I'm using Docker. And it's going to, uh, you, you're going to have to set up one file per machine or deploy it somehow. All the rest is then handled automatically because this is the only secrets we have. Yeah, so when you go back to the script, you'll see that it simply starts and it starts the measurement device there, the temperature measurement, and then it starts an infinite loop or at least almost infinite until we want it to stop, um, where it simply goes and gets its configuration, handle its configuration, output the configuration, or the output of the, um, yeah, of the handle configuration. Now this is actually, the, the thing is whenever you have an event, the register job event here, up here, whenever an event happens, it happens in a background job. So this, the uh, register event, it just goes in a loop, you know, it, it, that's the device tries to measure again and again, and around every 30 seconds, it gets a, a successful measurement, <clears throat> excuse me, and then it's actually a job that has run. So whenever we run our loop, we get any jobs that has any data and output it to the screen. And that's why you can see, if I scroll up, that's why you can see this part here, where we have the actual temperature output and so on. That again and then we simply write the time if anything happens we are gonna fail and here comes one thing that i forgot in the beginning if anything fails try and turn off the water because if you don't and something uh, crashes you might end up having the the valves open and these are 200 liters per hour and I ran them for eight hours. So it's a lot of water. Luckily, my container is only 80 liters. So about two or three times my tomato 40 liter um, pot has received 80 liters of water, which is quite too much. But I wanted to try and fix itself. So instead of just turning it off, I'm simply going to restart the machine. Actually, I have never seen this happen because this code has never really failed. Uh, the only thing that I have for failures is, of course, if the Wi-Fi breaks down. So this script is fairly simple, right? Uh, it, it's straight out. Uh, the only thing that's quite a little bit complex is, of course, this event handling. And if we make a function for that, like st start dh dht, then it works great. Okay, that's the actual code itself. So let's look at how we configure it and how we run it on the Raspberry Pi. So I want to also configure on boot. So as I said, if it fails, we reboot the machine. So I want the machine to be able to auto fix itself. And how do we do that? Well, we have the Raspberry Pi, of course. <clears throat> on the Raspberry Pi, when you run the install script, which is this script right here, it installs Docker. It also gets, you know, a configuration and some other files that we need to start the actual Docker stuff. Um, so if we go back here, you see that the Docker gets, so a Docker needs a Docker file to describe its image, but some people haven't realized or doesn't know that you can, that file doesn't have to be on a local device. It could be on a website. So the Docker file is on GitHub in the repo. I can show it to you right here, Docker file, and I get back to exactly what it does. Um, but this is the Docker file that actually configures the machine. But maybe we should just show it here. So it, it says it gets a specific device, a, a, a specific image to start from, and then it starts installing stuff. So the first thing it gets is the image, as I said. Then it gets the actual PowerShell version, the PowerShell version that we want to run from the actual PowerShell uh, GitHub repo from the releases that are defined in there. Then it gets scripts, modules, whatever is needed 
from my GitHub repo. Look at the Docker file first. You'll see that up here is the actual device name. And I should say thank you to, to, uh, to Trevor Sullivan because his blog about running PowerShell on Raspberry Pi, I looked it up and, and Trevor Sullivan has posted this thing about running Docker on your Raspberry Pi to run PowerShell. And I was like, hmm, isn't that like overkill? Well, it isn't because it makes it much more simple to set up. So the base of this is actually from the official Docker file uh, and from uh, following um, uh, Sullivan's, Sullivan's blog post. So the first thing that happens is we, we find the image. Here we set some different values which we in turn use later. So the first one is what version of PowerShell do we want to run? Preview 5. Maybe we should go and see what the newest one is. Um, which is right here. You see it's the releases. Easier to copy here than you see. It's simply just the same link as when we go here and look at releases. And you see 101, 0 0.1.7.1.0 preview 3. I don't know if this preview three will work with the code, but maybe we'll try. Otherwise, we'll just go back. So if I want to update the actual version of PowerShell running on my device, all I would do was to change this. I think in the matter of time here, um, I don't want to, to have it download everything again. It takes a few minutes uh, to, to download and unpackage but I could easily change the version here. You see what it does is the each of these run, when you look at a Docker file, each of these run commands, they, they do an extra change to the actual Docker image and set something up. So the first one called run, it goes and updates the actual machine, make sure it has the right libraries that, that it, you know, updates the list of, of packages it can get. Then it installs packages that is required by PowerShell. Then it goes to PowerShell GitHub and finds the PS version and the actual package here for Linux ARM32 and downloads that using vget. Then it unpacks it and then it actually um, yeah, simply unpacks it to the right locations and we now have PowerShell on the machine. But before we do that, all this installation has done some, some temporary files and stuff. So we do an app get clean, which up here, the install command, all the temporary files that it made will then be cleaned. And then we clean up another folder, which is not needed. Because the thing about Docker is that if you have anything here that is temporary, you should remove it before you finish your run command, because then it never gets into your Docker image and it doesn't take any space. So clean up temporary files, for example, clean up anything that you would need, and then, and then you're good to go. The next thing is what I call GHouse tools version. So this is the uh, a zip package that contains the actual modules and the DLLs that, that we would need for the PowerShell script. It simply downloads to Greenhouse and then it comes from my, my GitHub here. And then we can unzip it um, into the Greenhouse folder. The last thing is the actual script. And you see that the script also is on the on the actual GitHub here. But the script has a version number in the file name, which you can see up here, 0.4.4. And I know that often you want your script to be the same name always, and then just put your version inside the script. But the whole thing here is that if we don't change anything in one of these runs, let's say we rerun, restart our Docker, and it looks and it says, oh, I ran this last time you ran, so I don't have to run it again because there was no changes. He also didn't change this, so that's great. But if I change the next one to five, for instance, then it suddenly has to get another file, and then this has changed. So these will be still used from the cache from last time it built the image, but this one will be rebuilt. So if I want to switch to version 0.4.5, let's see, you can see in here that it runs 044. Well, there we go. Easy to see there. 044 right now. So I change this to 045 and I'll change the name of the file here to 045. 
and then of course I have a version in here, 045. And this is just for demo purposes. Um, but now I have changed the actual version of my script. I could have changed PowerShell version. I could have changed this. I could have added more libraries. I could do anything because this actually describes the whole setup of the Raspberry Pi Docker image, which is what runs the greenhouse stuff. So the last thing is you want to say what's called the entry point. What should the Docker file start when it's uh, has has built and has booted up? What we want to start is PowerShell, and then to PowerShell we want to give it the link to our script so it starts our script. So this is how it starts. So every time I reboot the machine, it's going to rebuild its image. It's going to get the new version from from GitHub, and it's going to uh, start it. So this is wh why I say it's super simple to handle many of these if you want to. They could all use the same configuration here, the same version. They could use different versions. You could make uh, subfolders. You could make multiple Docker files. There is infinite possibilities of what you want to do and how flexible this can can actually be set up. And I don't think there's a limit of how many. I mean, if you have over a million greenhouses, maybe that's too much, but you probably have money for bigger solutions than Raspberry Pi then. So I changed it here, right? And I have now a change ready right there. And if I check this in version 045, so I check it into GitHub. I upload it to GitHub, sync it to GitHub here. And then if we look in my greenhouse repo, you see that it has changed to 145. And if we click here, you see that's the new script for five. And link I'm using is the raw link. And you see that raw link also points to 045. You should know that if you're testing this, this raw link can be up to 15 minutes delayed. If you if you already uh, accessed it like 10 minutes before and you then update it, it can take up to 15 or 20 minutes before it updates again. So this is why I did not access this link before I went into um, I went into my um, yeah before I changed the code and checked in the, the change. So here we have the change. So all I have to do now is to reboot this machine. So first thing I'll do is detach this and then we go into those sudo reboot. And after the reboot, I'm going to try and reconnect as soon as possible. So we're probably going to get some errors on it's not up yet. But if I can connect very soon, then you can see that it's actually downloading and building the image. If I'm not quick enough, well, then it's already running. There we go. So we'll wait a little. Always take longer, or it seems to take longer when you're doing demos, of course, but it's probably not. It's just the time that goes slower. But now it seems to be almost answering. At least it hasn't aired out yet. It can be quite difficult to catch it exactly when it's building the image because it does go quite quick. Let's try again. Restart. There you go. Wi-Fi. You see here now it's downloading the Docker image here, but it's using the cacher from the old ones. As I said, I haven't changed those. But here it goes and downloads the file and, and don't mind the actual red text. That's just because the uh, git file actually, uh, git command actually outputs to error out for some reason. But now it gets the file and says, OK, and now it starts the thing and it built the image and you'll see now it starts. We'll have the new version here and now it's updated. So it's super simple for me to change anything around the code because it's automatically built using uh, Docker. When you run PowerShell on your Raspberry Pi, you could also install it directly. There's no um, problem with that. Um, all you have to think of is that you have to have the right libraries installed. 
of course, there is a guide for that uh, when you on the on the PowerShell page. When you look at my repo here, you see that I have a re readme that explains all the different parts of of the solution. It looks a bit prettier here. Um, manual installation, install Docker, auto installation, where I can buy some of the devices. Yep, and how you can install and run PowerShell. All right. With that said, let's go and look at scheduling. Because the thing is, for to change anything, to turn on any water. Oh, reminds me, did I turn off the water? I did, right? <laughs> um, so uh, we're sending the metrics, as I said. Let's just restart that one. That, okay. Sending the metrics and the plant is here, right? So we could put in our Azure automation or make more Azure functions if we wanted to. And then on a specific schedule, we could actually trigger PowerShell code to go and set the config on, on SharePoint. And one idea I've had, which I haven't implemented for this demo, is to use Azure storage account, table storage as the, as the endpoint. That would be super simple from PowerShell to edit. It doesn't have the nice GUI from SharePoint, but I think you can quickly make something in Power App anyway. But then we just set the config, turn on the water, then it turns on the water, it gets the config, and then of course the plant grows. Um, so this is super simple because again, we do not have to send messages to the device. We don't have to have a tunnel into the device, VPN or whatever crazy solutions you could think of. The device is stupid, it's unintelligent edge, so it goes and gets its configuration from the function, which gets its configuration from somewhere. So any automation I want to control, I simply control in the cloud. But since we have the metrics in log analytics, we could do smarter stuff. We could make a, an alert rule that says, if the soil moisture goes below 50%, then you need to turn on the water for X amount. And if we calculate how much water comes out of the out of the actual uh, hose per minute, uh, then we could easily then we could easily um, uh, calculate how many liters or gallons comes out, and and then how much water the plant gets. So we use Azure Monitor to make an alert that starts automation. Again, could be Azure automation could be anything. We set the configuration in SharePoint which in turn is of course connected to the Azure function because when we get the config, it gets it from the SharePoint and then the plant grows. So there's lots of opportunities in how you would do this. And, and since I have uh, had this running for quite a while and almost a full, uh, yeah, since the uh, January, unfortunately I had a I had to switch to a new machine, um, but I still have the data from the old from a few years back. So you can actually do trend lines. You could do machine learning to figure out whatever special. <laughs> and if you have a specific day, we could make an Azure monitor for when the when the temperature gets too low and I have to run out and, and save the plants or something like that. Other uses. There is. My my colleague, he asked me, he wants to do some swimming pool automation because it needed to uh, be heated up to a certain point. It also needed to have some pumps turned on at least to one hour a day. Either if it had already run, it shouldn't run again. But if it hadn't run, then it should run at least one hour. So that was almost the same. Measuring temperatures um, and then turning off and on pumps. Uh, depending on logic, but the, since the logic is made in, 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 in Azure Monitor, well, then you could do anything. And of course, there's a ton of other uses. I just haven't really found any specifics. So if you have any ideas, please uh, submit. Yeah. And if we look at this again, go back here, back here. So if we look at the actual usage, for instance, this is my my log analytics workspace. And I, I know this is in Danish crowns, but this is around one euro for one month. 
So it's about a euro a month in, in because I've set the data retention here to, to, to 720 days. If I go into the logs here, you'll see that I can, I don't want any examples right now, but I can go and see custom logs here. You see dev, and there's also V2 um, here, and you'll see all the data that comes in right here. And since we have all these values here, we can go and make visualizations, of course. And we could go and make a chart here of uh of temperature here oh yeah temperature d anything like that but that's just for 24 but then i can turn it into a dashboard and it starts looking like this so you can see the actual trend lines you see how it went down and from this we can go back for instance to as i said this was a new version i set up or at least a new name so it does only go back to april but if i Take an old, you see it starts in April. You see here we hit almost freezing point, and that's the critical point for the for some of the plants. While other plants have a critical point at at 10 degrees, such as uh, basil or, or uh, eggplant. Um, so here you can see the trend lines, and you can see the same thing about the humidity it goes up and down. But this is actually currently still showing seven days. So let's switch back to seven days, so we can see that it's really following each other. See, every time the temperature drops here, the humidity rises up to 100, and then it goes down again when the temperature rises again. And we see at the moment in May, we get around 40 degrees Celsius. In, in mid of summer, we should get around 50 degrees Celsius, but anything over 40 is bad for the tomatoes. So <laughs> we need to go and make some shade so it doesn't get up to 50 degrees. I'd like to show you a little bit more detail around the solution and how we start um, Docker and the Docker image. So the first thing is here is the repo. As I said, it has a great guide on how to do it. A quick installation using an install script, but also a detailed manual installation guide. And if we look into the repo here, you see that the install script, it installs prerequisites such as Docker, screen, get my, my files, and so on. This thing called ghouse init, that's the script we execute on every boot. The file rc local is a part of uh, the OS, which we replace with a new one that triggers our script. This is what sets startup, such as you you know from Windows, where we have it in, in a startup folder. And the ghouse init is, is the interesting one because the first command it runs is the build command and it tags it greenhouse so that we can easily identify it when we want to run it in the next command. But it takes, as I mentioned, um, the actual Docker file from GitHub. Then when it has built this, and as you saw in the demo, it only builds the changes. So if it has, has no changes, it takes only a few seconds maybe one or two seconds. If it has changes, it takes anywhere from one minute to 10 minutes, depending on how much, how many changes and how much it needs to download. So for instance, when you have this Docker file and if this changes, then the rest, everything will be recompiled. If the second one changes, then this will be recompiled. And if the last one changes, it'll only be that one, as you saw in my demo. When we start the actual image, we need to put on uh, give some arguments to to actually make it work properly. First of all, we want to set the host name to the host name of the machine, because that means that we can actually go and just use simply use the um, uh, the computer name of the actual Raspberry Pi device. So if we wanted to set up a hundred, we could give them different host names. Or we could make this script more flexible so it doesn't use the real host name but generates a host name or whatever. At least this is a very flexible way where we can send in host name, either the real host name or something else. When you run a Docker container normally, you won't see the actual output of the container. So it's going to run and then you can, you can remote into it, something like that. But in our case, we want to run it as interactive. 
because we want to run it so that we can see the output of the script as I showed you when I did the screen. This is the output of the actual Docker file or Docker image that's running. Another thing about Docker is it's meant to that you make a, a Docker um, instance and then you build an instance and then it runs. If you reboot the machine, it stays there because that's what you usually want with a container or you could compare it to a virtual machine. But in this case, we don't want that because if we reboot, we want our startup file to pick up the new Docker file as I showed in the demo and make a new image. So in this case, we add this rm command for remove, which means that whenever we remove, when you shut down, it's, it's going to remove that instance of the Docker uh, image, which means when we start up, it's going to build a computer new image for us and again use the cache to do it quickly. But it means that we won't have multiple images running and we don't have to do anything advanced about has it changed? Do I need to remove the old one and replace it with another one? So on. The next two is related to the to the permissions that the the actual image has with the privilege when it's running as privileged it means it can access the hardware and and as you know we need to access the outputs and input pins so that we can turn on pumps so we can read metrics we need to access the usb port to to see the um webcam if that what if, if we want that and that could be any other thing so with privileged a mode you will have access to everything just as if you were running on the actual machine. <clears throat> the last thing is the config file because the config file is actually on the actual machine and not inside Docker. So we can make a config file and then we can rerun this Docker and remake this image again and again, but it keeps using the same config file from outside Docker. With this V, v argument, we can map one file from outside to inside the actual um, uh, yeah, file system of the Docker container. And now in the end, we simply have the name, the tag, so that we start the correct one. So this is how we start Docker in a, in a one, once deploy, once delete when we shut down way and with the right permissions and everything. If we look at the RC local file, you'll see that it's gonna, as a, as a, a privileged user, it's gonna um, run this command called screen. Um, it names the screen G house. So you'll see that if I list the screens here, it's called G house, which makes it easier for us to identify it if we have multiple screens. You know, people who are using shells like this, they tend to have many screens sometimes. Um, and then we use the sudo command to actually just run the G house init script. And then we exit this startup script. So this will be executed every time we we start the machine and it's going to start our greenhouse. So it looked like this, right? We had the relays, we had the Arduino device and it has uh, connected to, to network. And then I got some, some Wi-Fi turned on it um, and I got some, you see the sensors on the right side here, which are the, the soil sensors. I'm measuring my water here. And then it turned into this, where it's a bigger Arduino, and now it's starting to look what, how it does today, right? So you have some pumps, but these pumps turned out to be, no, this is not pumps, sorry, this is valves, where I would put pressurized water on, but these cannot do 200 liters per, per hour. They do like 2,000 liters per hour, so it was too much. I never plugged it in, it stopped it before it, yeah, it could have gone all wrong. Um, and then it turned into this, where we have the, the pumps with the, the hoses that goes in and it turn, goes into our my container for water, which collects rainwater also um, and, and uses that. Then it turned into that with a little uh, <laughs> lid on and, and a, a nice uh, antenna. And that's how it looks today. Of course, I'm planning maybe this season to actually make a hole in the box and, and make sure it's, you know, tight with silicone and stuff so that I can make a proper box instead of having to have that lid half closed. And as I mentioned in the beginning, I brought it to Orlando in Ignite and they do look quite weird at you at the airport with this device. So the summary is partial on Raspberry Pi rocks. First of all, when I did the, 
the Arduino stuff, it was super difficult. You can imagine it as like when you started Quake or Doom, you either choose beginner, immediate, expert, or hell or something like that. Oh, that's in Diablo. But anyway, you have an extreme level too. So I started at extreme level. I wanted to do it as the smallest device as possible, but it means you have to code your own protocols and and think about memory usage and, and it crashed all the time and you have no logs because it doesn't even have any any memory to write to. It doesn't have SD card and it doesn't run PowerShell or .NET. Um, it runs its own little C language. So that was fun, but it quickly turned into something that was quite annoying because it's I made it almost work, but then it would crash every three or four weeks. And in, in Arduino, there is no good uh, exception handling. So that's one of the great things about .NET. When you have an error, you get an exception, you can handle the exception. That seems basic for us, but it's not that in all types of code or all types of devices. In Arduino, it simply runs out of memory and stops the command in the middle. And then you'll have to, hopefully, it, it just, you have something called a watchdog. So if it hasn't run for a few seconds, it just reboots itself. Super simple, but not, so flexible. So switching to Raspberry Pi, I made this work in a matter of hours because I had the, the, the actual uh, function in, in Azure. I just needed to write the PowerShell to make that loop. And it was super easy to do. And I see I forgot to remove the sample. We just do that quickly. There we go. Using Docker makes it super dynamic. It means I can also configure my device from an external file. This is super powerful as long as the device has internet connection. So this means that, I mean, you could do this if you had a 3G antenna, you could put it outside in remote locations and have it connect to internet uh, and then sends it stuff and connects it, whatever. But if you, yeah, and if you put it online, uh, like a hosting at GitHub, it makes it even more flexible. So you don't have to have a local file. You can connect to, to online and get that. Azure Functions or any API, but Azure Functions is a super quick way to make it. And you can actually make APIs in PowerShell in Azure Functions. Makes it super easy to integrate. The reason I started doing that instead of going directly, because now when it's run PowerShell, you could argue, why don't you send directly to, to Log Analytics? Well, in the beginning, it was because Log Analytics needed a HTTPS secure connection. Arduino doesn't do that easily. So I had to have an HTTP endpoint. So I made a function without any authentication, maybe an API key if you want to, but not anything like uh, have to uh, authenticate with Azure AD and stuff and all this advanced stuff, which can be difficult to code in small devices. But the Azure functions can easily do managed identity and connect to Azure AD or graph API and all these things. And then we can, open a simpler entry like HTTP without HBS. I mean, if somebody were to pick up my numbers from my greenhouse, I, I'm not sure I'd, they would be able to use it for anything. So I'm not really scared about that. But anyway, this was my demo around my um, greenhouse and hopefully it would look like this later this year, maybe a little more tidy up, but otherwise it's pretty nice. Um, and if you have any questions, my, my Twitter handle is right here. So thank you for watching. I hope you liked it. Have a good day.